Good to see everybody today. Hope that you're doing well. And uh, as winter has returned this morning, hope that you are uh, staying warm. And we're glad that you're here with us and able to assemble to worship this morning. And uh, I will go ahead and tell you up front that this morning's lesson is one that uh, I feel somewhat unqualified to present and talk about. We're going to continue our series about finding our place, <clears throat> finding our role, figuring out where we fit in life. And as we've been going through this series, we've <clears throat> said that each one of us is uh, a piece of a much bigger puzzle, that we're trying to find our, our place in the world. We're trying to figure out where the church fits in to this great big world that we're in. We talked <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago to our young people about what their place is in the world. And this morning, we're going to examine and look at our place within our families. And as we go through this discussion, uh, I hope that we'll glean something from, from what we talk about. Next week, uh, Butch is going to speak to us. He will be celebrating next Sunday morning the 37th anniversary of his first Sunday here at LJ, 37 years. So he's going to talk to us about some of his memories and present the lesson next week. Looking forward to that. And then the following week, we will conclude this series of lessons by looking at our role and our place within God's family. You can go ahead and open your Bibles to Ephesians 5. That's where we're going to be in just a few minutes. The family. I guess at the outset of this lesson, we need to establish a few things about the family because there's a lot of confusion right now in the world. For the first time in a long time, the dynamics of families in this country are flipped upside down. That things in the way that we've always understood them are just different. And, and the things that we've always understood as accepted norms are, are no longer taken that way. Things are just very hard and tough for the family right now. I could go down this long list of statistics about children being raised in various difficult situations and same-sex marriage and, and how that is changing the way that families work and function. We could go down this, this long list, but you already know those things. What we have to realize is that the family, as much as the world would like to take credit for it, is something that God has ordained since the beginning of time. So when we look at how, how do I figure out my family, how do I figure out my place, how do I work on the, the dynamics, how do I make my home a good place, we can't turn to the advice of a group of people who didn't create the family. We need to look to God's word to figure out how we live and how to act. And I want to establish this at the outset of this lesson too. We see when we talk about family, this image of the perfect family. Ward and June Cleaver from Leave It to Beaver, the perfect husband and wife who never say a crossword to each other and everything's perfect all the time. And, and, and yeah, the beaver was a little bit, you know, uh, mischievous or rambunctious, but, but he and Wally were, were two great kids and everything was wonderful. I want us to understand this perfect family that we see in pictures, this perfect family that we see on television, that does not exist. That uh, is a figment of our imagination, a, a figment of the way that we glorify things, and things that we see on TV are figments of some producer somewhere that, that created something for us to understand. If you're sitting here this morning and you look around and you say, you know, that, that family, they've just really got it together, I can assure you that that family has their own struggles as well. All of us have difficulties. And this morning you may be sitting there and you say, well, I've been through this, or my family's been through this, or I'm in this situation. God's word still applies to us no matter what situation we're going through in life. So if you're sitting here this morning, I don't want you to feel like that your family is inferior because of some struggle you go through, because this doesn't exist. We all struggle in life, but that's okay. But we need to be looking to God's word to figure out how to make our family be what God would want it to be. And we're going to do that just for a little while this morning. So, so I guess the question is, we want to ask first, why is there so much, so much dysfunction within families? We hear all the time about uh, struggles within families. A little boy was in history class, 
And his teacher quoted Winston Churchill's immortal saying, We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, and we shall fight in the hills. And the little boy said, How did Winston Churchill know about my family vacations? Because that's the way it seems sometimes. There's always a problem. There's always fighting. There's always some conflict. Well, why does this dysfunction exist? My, my friend Michael Whitworth uh, wrote a blog a while back, and, and these were the five reasons he listed. I'll just share them with you very briefly. The first one, and we've talked about this before, unhealthy expectations. Unhealthy expectations. We have these in all of our relationships, don't we? If you're a spouse, you have a certain expectation of your spouse the way that they should live, the way that they should act, the things that they should do, the things that they should say. Parents have them of their children. The way your child should act at school, the way they should perform in athletics, the way they should behave. Parents have these expectations, or children have these expectations of their parents. What their parents should provide, how they should treat them, what mom should make for dinner, what dad should cook on the grill. We have these expectations as well. But from time to time, we build these and we make them unhealthy. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. So, number one, I need to communicate my expectations if I have them. And number two, I don't need to bind my expectations on somebody else. Because that's unfair to do. So, number one, unhealthy expectations of each other. Number two, selfishness. It's a big one. Spencer read from Philippians 2. I won't read that verse again, but selfishness. The reason we have some of these problems in our families is because we're selfish and we look at our own needs ahead of those that live with us. Thirdly, poor priorities. Joshua 24, 15, that very famous verse says, Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Sometimes we have our priorities completely out of whack. We focus on our jobs or our hobbies or whatever it might be instead of our families. Number four, a lack of communication. James chapter 1, 19, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. We've talked about before that communication is not just words. In fact, a very small percentage of communication is actual verbal language. Most of communication is other things, body language and the, the, the way that we deal with each other. So lack of communication. We might be married to someone, yet we're like ships passing in the night. Maybe the relationship is more like roommates than husband and wife. Lack of communication. And fifthly, a lack of self-awareness, a lack of self-awareness. We just don't understand what we're doing and how we're living. Second Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Sometimes we have to look within ourselves and say, am I, am I being the spouse that I need to be? Am I being the parent I need to be? And whenever we don't take time to do that, we just continue focusing on ourselves. So that certainly doesn't exhaust the list, but these are some of the reasons that we have family dysfunction. We have this, these dysfunctional situations in our lives. So we can be frustrated about it, or we can say, all right, what does the Bible say about fixing it? So this morning, in the time that we have, I want to look at the roles of Christian men within the family, the roles of Christian women within the family, and the roles of Christian children within the family. And, and let me say again, I, I don't feel completely qualified to talk about some of these things, but we're going to look at what God's Word says and see how we can better improve those dynamics. Number one, the role of Christian men. And this is important. And I ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read this passage together. You need to have this open. <clears throat> we'll start reading in verse 22. And I'm just going to read it, and then we'll comment on it as we go along. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22. This is from the New King James Version. It says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this reason, verse 31, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. Chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, in verse 4, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There's the probably most exhaustive passage talking about the family dynamics. And the first thing that jumps out to me is, is this, that God has told men to be the head of the household. That's an awesome responsibility. So what goes along with that then? If God has told me I need to be the head of the household, well, why is this such a problem? Why are there women trying to usurp this position? And, and, and why are there so many men that aren't living and leading their homes? Well, it's because we forgot what it means to be a Christian man. In our Thursday morning devotionals, we're studying this book called Sons of Dust. And, and it deals with this idea of biblical masculinity. And, and it's pretty interesting to see what it talks about because it talks about, yes, that Christian men are supposed to be meek. And we've talked about before what meekness means. It was that word originally used in the, in the Greek to talk about harnessing the power of, of, of a horse, a large animal that has all this power, yet we're able to harness it. Well, a meek person still has that power within them, but they're able to harness it and use it to accomplish something. It, it talks about that, but it talks about the fact that men are still supposed to be Man in leadership position. So the man is supposed to be the head of the household. And that's not a position of authority. It's a position of, of great responsibility. And there's some more things that go with that. Number one, a Christian man is to be a, a partner. Listen to what this says about being a husband. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Gave himself for her. Verse 28, listen to this. Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Then jump down to verse 33. Let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as of himself and let the wife see she respects her husband. You know, there, there's this great discussion about respect and submission. No man is able to make his wife be in submission to him. Unfortunately, that's a situation that we've seen and we see now it's come to the forefront in our society about the, this idea of domestic violence and, and and how prevalent it is men we're supposed to be partners to our wives we say that man is the head of the household that doesn't put him up here and the wife here marriage is a joint venture in which we work together so when we aren't being the partner that we need to be it's impossible to rule the household. Man is supposed to be a partner. Secondly, man is supposed to be a parent. I read this story and uh, I'm going to share it with you. It was pretty striking to me. George Mallory uh, is the famous mountain climber. Uh, he was the first to peach, reach the peak of Mount Everest and uh, in pursuit of this dream he lost his life. And in the introduction to the book, The Last Climb, his son John, who was just three when his dad died, talked about this accomplishment. This is what he wrote, though. He said, I would so much rather have known my father than to have grown up in the shadow of a legend, a hero as some people perceived him to be.
as men, a lot of times we worry about our legacy and our career and how we're going to be remembered and how much money we can make and how well-known we'll be and what people will say about us. And this man says, when I was a little boy, my dad was a hero to the world, but I would much rather have had, had him around as a father. I've said this before, and, and I don't mean it to be bleak or morbid, but no matter how important you are, when you leave this world, the world will forget you. But who will remember you as long as they live is your family. So, men, stop worrying about how important you are at your job or how important you are to other people and be important to your family. You need to be a parent. Thirdly, men need to be a provider. A provider. And I think in the typical sense, we've always imagined a situation where the man goes out and goes to work and the wife stays home and takes care of the children and cooks and cleans. And that's the image that we've seen. But the reality is that's not the way the world works anymore. As a matter of fact, over 75% of women now work, most of them full-time jobs. So when we say that it's for man to be a provider, it's not necessarily being the sole breadwinner for the family. But there is this instruction for man to provide for his family in all the ways possible to be a provider. Thirdly, or fourthly, a protector, a protector. Man is supposed to be a protector. And, and for those of you that are men, that instinct is within us. If someone was to start to come into your home, you would not expect your wife to say, Honey, you go grab the gun and go downstairs and see what's going on. As men, hopefully that instinct within us is to go and <clears throat> make sure that our home is secured and make sure that our families are protected. Man should be a protector. <clears throat> but above all those things, above being a provider and a protector, man needs to be a spiritual leader, a spiritual leader. <clears throat> I think in this projection of what we think the family is supposed to be like, men in our country and in our society have said, well, <clears throat> the woman takes care of the home. She can also provide the spiritual instruction. Increasingly, men are not involved in churches and are leaving the spiritual instruction in their lives to their wives. And that's very problematic. Men are supposed to be, first off, leading by example and providing spiritual instruction to their families. Man needs to be a spiritual leader. <clears throat> we could go down a, a great deal of, of things that fall into that category, but... That's a good start for our purposes this morning. So what about women, the role of Christian women? You know, this topic has come to the forefront in our culture this week. Last weekend, there was a tremendous uh, set of marches all over the country that talked about women's rights. These, these marches talking about the women's rights. And, and a lot of the things that were being argued are valid points. There's no reason that in the country that we live in that women and men with the same exact education, with the same exact position, make different salaries. That's not right. It's immoral. It's also not fair that women of, uh, from minorities or women that are minorities make much less than white women. That, that, those things are not right. Those things should be dealt with and they should be handled. But this idea that Women are being treated as inferiors, particularly in Christian circles, is laughable. If you went back and looked at the position of, of women as related to men in, in antiquity, it would blow your mind. The way that, that women were treated and the way they were disrespected in Greek culture and Roman culture and, and particularly in Jewish culture. Go and look at the way that women are treated in Islamic culture. And yet when you open up God's word in the Bible, you see stories about women like, like Deborah and Naomi and Ruth. You look in the New Testament and you see women like Phoebe who are, who's called a servant. You see women like, like Lydia who was responsible for the first conversions on a continent. You see um, Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, a missionary team. You see these countless stories of powerful women that were essential parts of God's plan, and yet we say that for somehow that, that Christianity looks down on women. 
It couldn't be farther from the truth. So what about the role of Christian women? The first two are, are similar. To be a partner in marriage. To be a parent. And I, want, and I want to say this, and I think it's important that it's said. Fathers will never have the same relationship with a child that mothers do. It's just different. It's not the same. Because of the relationship between mother and child. And I'm not saying that fathers can't raise children and that single fathers have no shot. They I, I are a lot of wonderful children, I'm sure, that are, were raised by single fathers. But, but that relationship is special and it needs to be taken very seriously. So a, a woman needs to be a good spouse and a good parent, just like a man needs to be a good spouse and a good parent. Thirdly, though, I think this is important, that women need to be nurturers. And, and we talk about the way that men and women work together. And we could go down and look at how the brain works differently for a man and woman and all the different hormones that are produced and all the physical and chemical differences. We could look at that, but I think we understand that women are nurturers. I uh, read an article the other day that said that there was a hospital that was going to open its first intensive care unit for men suffering with colds. Because when a man is sick, he is the biggest baby that's ever walked the face of the earth. And when a woman is sick, she gets up and goes to work every morning and takes care of the family and cooks and continues to do what she does even when she doesn't feel well. When a child gets up in the middle of the night because they've had a bad dream or they don't feel well or they've wet the bed, they don't come run and say, Dad. They say, Mommy, Mommy. And I know for a lot of women, that's not a very natural feeling of being a nurturer, but I think that's what husbands and children need from their wives is to be nurturers. Next, <clears throat> women need to be teachers. I say this with all sincerity and no sarcasm at all. I'm so glad that I was not born a woman because women have much harder lives than men and a lot more responsibility and a lot more obligation to a lot more people. Teaching is one of those obligations. The Bible tells women to very um, importantly teach the younger women how to be mothers and how to be wives and how to raise their families. Women have to be teachers. And then finally, women have to be virtuous. And I always wondered what that meant because I heard Proverbs 31 quoted over and over again. Proverbs 31, who, who can find a virtuous woman? So I said, well, what is a virtuous woman? And I went and examined the text. And here's my conclusion about what the virtuous woman is. A virtuous woman is a woman that can do anything. The virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31 took care of her family. She was loved and respected and adored by her husband. She was respected in the community. She was able to go out and make business deals. She had a job. She made a profit. She was a woman that could do and was willing to do anything. And listen, I know that nobody's perfect, but the virtuous woman that God says we need to be is the one who's willing and capable of doing almost anything. So when we sit here and say that, that the husband is the head of the household, it's not that somehow man is more important than woman in the home or that, or that man is a head of woman. It's that God has put us in positions where there are these two equal parts, but one person has to be the head and that one person has to be the one that leads. And that one person, the man, when he stands before God, will be accountable for the way that his family turned out. But women have these very important roles as well. Once again, not an exhaustive list, but a start for our purposes this morning. The role of Christian children. Number one, and we read this in Ephesians chapter 6, is to be obedient. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So children shouldn't just be obedient to their parents because they, um, <clears throat> I hope y'all are listening to this, put food on your table and make sure that you have a roof over your head and take you to school every day and buy what you need and give you spending money and all the things that they do for you. That it shouldn't just be that. That children should be obedient to their parents because it's the right thing to do according to God. Being obedient. Secondly, children need to be a helper. Need to be a helper. 
Think about if you're a young person this morning and there's some sitting over here and scattered throughout. What do you do when you get home from school every day? Or what do you do when you uh, come in from an activity? Do you just go straight to your room and flop on the bed or turn on the TV or play on the smartphone or turn on the Xbox? What do, what do you do? There's said, it's, it's been said that there's nothing more useless than a set of parents who put together a chart of chores. I remember my mom doing that when I was a kid over and over again. You're going to be responsible for the trash, you're going to vacuum, and then within a couple days, mom is back to doing everything. Be a helper in your life. Thirdly, honor. Honor your parents and your family. Sometimes parents have unhealthy expectations of their children. But our children should never dishonor their parents by the way that they act. It's not what Christian children do. And then finally, Christian children need to mature. They need to grow up. They need to grow into who God would have them to be. What you can't have happen is this, that you've very famously seen from Dr. Phil this week where children are disrespectful to their parents and embarrass their families. Y'all are welcome. So there's all these lofty expectations, right? I mean, we've talked about men and what they need to be and women what they need to be and children what they need to be, and these are just short lists. We could go and and, and pick apart Scripture and find all these things we need to do, and it kind of gets overwhelming, right? How am I supposed to be perfect? How am I supposed to do all this? Well, Rest assured that none of us are going to be. But these are some essentials, I think, for the family. These five things, and I want you to remember these. Whenever you're struggling, whenever things are going rough, I want you to remember these five essentials. And I think that this will help us in our family dynamic. Number one, faith is always first. But we're going to be faced with a lot of choices about what we do in the way that we live. Next Sunday night, we're going to have an evening service at 6 o'clock. And at 6.30, a football game kicks off. I've already told you the Patriots are going to win that football game, so I don't know why everybody's so worked up about it, but there's going to be a football game on. So at 6.30, will you be in front of the television watching Matt Ryan throw interceptions, or will you be here worshiping God? And I say that lightheartedly, but we'll have a choice. On Wednesday night when your child has football practice and they have the choice between being there or here, where will they be? When we have the opportunity to work overtime or be at services on Sunday morning, what will we choose? When we're tired and we just want to stay at home on the couch, what what will we choose? When there's an opportunity to go out of town on vacation or go to a Lads to Leaders convention or a youth workshop or what will we choose? Faith is always first to the Christian family. And I want to add this caveat to that. There are times when for families to be as strong as they need to be that they do have to get away from the organized activities of the church. There are times where you need to go on vacation with your family. But, but in those situations... There needs to be that spiritual time. There needs to be family devotionals and family prayer time. And when the family's on vacation, it needs to worship somewhere. That, that faith, even in those times away from organized activities, that faith is still always first. That our faith is not a Sunday, Wednesday, convenient faith. It needs to always be first in our lives. Secondly, please remember this. We have to take advantage of good times. The difficulties in life are coming. There's going to be strains on marriages, strains on families. There's going to be health trouble. There's going to be financial difficulty. Those things are coming. So when you're sitting around and you realize one Saturday afternoon as you look around at your family that things are going really well, please take advantage of those moments. Don't bicker over silly things. Don't argue about things that are of no significance. When things are going well, when your health is there and you have food in the refrigerator and life is going well, please take advantage of those times. And along those same lines, have perspective in the hard times. 
you're probably sitting here this morning and every person here is going through something. Maybe you're struggling with self-esteem or you're worried about a diagnosis that you got from your doctor. You've got a surgery upcoming. All of us are struggling with something. We need perspective. Number one, remember that there's somebody maybe sitting very close to you that's going through something way worse and that you really are blessed. But remember as well that the hope that we have as Christians is that no matter what happens in our lives, everything will be okay. We have to maintain perspective in hard times. Fourthly, we need to find joy in little moments. Find joy in little moments. When you're sitting in your house and you look at your little child playing with the family dog, just sit and think how awesome that is. When you come home and you see your wife and she's sitting there and she's preparing dinner, even though she's been at work all day, realize how lucky you are. When you're sitting watching TV and your husband comes and lays his head down in your lap because he just wants to be close to you, take advantage of those. Celebrate those. Find joy in the little moments in life. I think that we increasingly want more and more and more. We think that our happiness has to be defined by the size of our home or what kind of car we're driving or, uh, or where we're going on vacation or whatever it might be. That's not what life is about. Life is about these little moments and finding joy in them. And the final thing, and the most important thing is get to heaven. Get to heaven. Derek Redmond is a great runner. <clears throat> he was running the 400 meter men's semifinal in the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona, Spain. Many of you remember those Olympics. But <clears throat> Derek, getting ready to finish that race, pulled a hamstring. He was leading the event. He was well on his way to being an Olympic hero and having all the glory. And he pulled his hamstring and fell to the ground. And immediately, of course, when that happens in a race, everybody ran right past. Derek, screaming in agony with a torn hamstring, stood up and started trying to finish the race. His father was in the stands, and this is, you know, at the Olympics, so there's security everywhere, and immediately his father made his way down to the track. And there's all these doctors and trainers telling him, oh, you need to stop, you need to stop, and he just told him to get away. He wanted to finish the race, and his father got down to the track and grabbed him. And he eventually, or originally yanked away from his dad, thinking it was somebody else trying to tell him to stop. And his dad looked at him and said, son, we'll finish this race together. So he and his father, arm in arm, didn't run, didn't trot, but really drugged themselves to the end of this track. And his father stepped away, and he crossed the finish line by himself. <clears throat> I was reading that illustration this week, and, and I thought, what a perfect way to describe the role of the family in life that sometimes we're not able to make it on our own, but with the love of our families, if we're all filling our role, if we're all playing our part and we're all our piece in the puzzle, maybe together, arm in arm, we can finish the race and be with God forever. I know that in your lives you think as a parent or as a child or as a spouse, there's all these roles you have to play, but the most important role you can ever play in your family is being the spiritual leader that helps your family get to heaven. So this morning, I, I don't know what you're struggling with. I hope that you don't beat yourself up. When we go through lessons like this and say, my family's been through this, or I've been through this, or, or I, I've been through a divorce, or my children are unfaithful, or whatever it is that we beat ourselves up and we say, I can't. That's not what these lessons are here to do. These lessons are here to make sure that today we're on the right track to being faithful to God and having ourselves be who he wants us to be. If you're living in sin this morning and you want to make something right, 
come forward and confess that, and we'll pray with you and pray for you. If you are just weak and need some prayers, come forward and let us pray with you. Most of all this morning, if you're not a Christian, baptistry is prepared. If you're ready to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can have your sins washed away. Whatever your need may be, come as we stand and as we